On March 21, 2024, the federal government, along with attorneys general from 15 states in the District of Columbia, filed a blockbuster antitrust lawsuit. And in antitrust, even where things are often big, this one is huge. U.S. v. Apple. I'm going to explain for you the government's case against Apple. On the strength of its iPhone sales, Apple became the first company in history to have a market value of more than three trillion dollars. Its net income, which is tops in the Fortune 500, is greater than the gross domestic product of more than a hundred countries. And now the Justice Department has got Apple in its antitrust vice and it's tightening the screws. Oh, it's okay. It's just, it's just paper. Thanks to its monopolization practices, Apple's iPhones are way too expensive. So to destroy one just for a video. The U.S. Justice Department, DOJ if you're cool, or just the government, is saying in this lawsuit that Apple's iPhone business is an ill-gotten monopoly. Specifically, the U.S. accuses Apple of violating Section 2 of the Sherman Act of 1890. The Sherman Act is the core of U.S. antitrust law. It is very brief and very vague. Section 2 concerns monopoly, and in this brief and vague law, the thing that Apple is accused of doing, the thing that you're not allowed to do, really just comes down to one word, monopolize. Now, key to that is the eyes. To monopolize is different than just having a monopoly. Having a monopoly isn't against the law. To monopolize, a company must have monopoly power and must have done bad things to get that monopoly or to keep that monopoly. The courts have interpreted the offense of monopolization to require proof that the defendant has monopoly power in a relevant market and that the defendant has used anti-competitive, aka exclusionary conduct to acquire or maintain that monopoly. That boils down to three key questions in the U.S. v. Apple antitrust lawsuit. One, what counts as a relevant market here? Two, does Apple have monopoly power in that market? And three, has Apple done exclusionary or anti-competitive things to get that monopoly power in that market or to keep that monopoly power? The answers to those questions, according to the government, are in this 88-page document, the complaint the document filed in federal court that formally begins this lawsuit. Issue one is what counts as a relevant market for determining whether or not Apple has a monopoly. And this is a big battleground in most antitrust lawsuits. The broader the market, the less likely a company is to have monopoly power. The more narrowly you define the market, the more likely you're going to find monopoly power. Defining a market for antitrust purposes is all about whether consumers would find certain goods reasonable substitutes for one another. For instance, if I'm suing an oil company for monopolization and I claim as a relevant market the retail sale of gasoline at the southwest corner of Main Street and First Street, that's way too narrow of a market definition. If that gas station jacked up prices, then there's plenty of reasonable substitutes. People would just go to other gas stations in the local area and buy gas from them. But if I'm an oil company defending a monopolization claim and I ask the court to look at the market for all combustible fossil fuels, that's too broad of a market. Because if I put diesel fuel into my gasoline car, my car won't go. So diesel's not a reasonable substitute. If I put natural gas into my car, it's just gonna float away out of the tank, so it's not a reasonable substitute. So that wouldn't be a relevant market. In the US v. Apple antitrust lawsuit, the government claims in its complaint that performance smartphones sold in the United States is a relevant market. So first, the geographic part. The government argues the United States is a relevant market because it's not reasonable for consumers to go to a foreign country to buy a cell phone. And besides, there's regulatory and compatibility issues with using a foreign purchased cell phone in the United States. Now for the product side, the government says it doesn't have to prove that Apple has a monopoly over all cell phones or even all smartphones. The government says that performance smartphones, that is higher end cell phones, is a relevant market for gauging monopoly. The government says that entry level smartphones aren't reasonable substitutes for an iPhone because without high capacity storage, 
high quality materials, faster processor, features like tap to pay, consumers won't find that to be a reasonable substitute for an iPhone. As a backup, the Justice Department alleges that all smartphones, including both higher end smartphones and lower end smartphones are a relevant market. They say that other cell phones, like those with a physical keyboard and without full internet or apps capability, aren't a reasonable substitute for smartphones and other devices like tablets or laptops that you can't put in your pocket and you can't use to call your mom aren't reasonable substitutes for a smartphone either. Issue two is monopoly power. The case law defines monopoly power as the power to control prices or exclude competition. Determining monopoly power is mostly about market share, but a court also has to consider other things, such as barriers to entry and things that keep customers tied down and keep them from easily switching to competitors. The government points out that Apple itself estimates its market share of the performance smartphone market to be 70%, and 70% is definitely in the zone of what courts have considered monopoly market share. And the government explains there are lots of factors tying customers to iPhone and creating barriers to entry for competitors. Particularly interesting, the government says because at this point, so many people have performance cell phones. In order for Apple's competitors to increase their market share, they really have to steal customers away from Apple. And that is really hard to do, the government says, because of the things Apple has done to make it a giant pain for their customers to switch to a different phone. Issue three is anti-competitive slash exclusionary conduct. This is the issue of whether Apple has engaged in naughty behavior, misdeeds, done bad, bad things to hold on to its monopoly and to keep competitors from taking hold and gaining strength. Now, you're allowed to get a monopoly by offering a better product, and you're allowed to charge high prices. After all, if prices affect competition, charging high prices is just going to act to drive customers into the arms of your competitors. So what is it you can't do? Essentially, you can't do things that would prevent competitors from taking root and establishing themselves so that they could rise up and take you on. The Justice Department's allegations for this just go on for pages and pages, but here are some highlights. The government says that Apple used contractual restrictions and fees on app creation and distribution to squelch app developers from providing things that could make users less dependent on their iPhone. The complaint alleges that Apple blocked so-called super apps, which are apps that serve as a platform for mini apps. Super apps have had success overseas, but they're not really a thing in the United States. And the reason why they haven't taken off here, according to the Justice Department, is because of what Apple has done. With super apps, the mini apps can be made to work cross-platform, meaning that you could then use those same mini apps on any device. That means the people who become dependent on mini apps within a super app are not dependent on their phone. They could get a new cell phone from a different manufacturer, load the super app, they'd have their mini apps, access their data, and they could just pick up where they left off. The complaint quotes an Apple manager as saying that if super apps were allowed to become the main gateway where people play games, book a car, make payments, etc., that would let the barbarians in at the gate, then the iPhone's stickiness goes down. The government also says that Apple used contractual restrictions and fees on app developers to prevent the emergence of cloud gaming apps, thus preventing cloud streaming technologies from developing that would have threatened to make users less dependent on their iPhones. The idea is that Apple makes a lot of money selling cell phones with very high processing storage memory capacity, and that with cloud technologies, those things might have been less necessary for consumers to get the same kind of functionality out of their phones. DOJ uses Apple's own words against it, saying that Apple feared a world where all that matters is who has the cheapest hardware and customers could buy an expletive Android for 25 bucks at a garage sale and have a solid cloud computing device that works fine. 
the government goes in for the kill to allege this is anti-competitive conduct by saying that Apple turned down substantial revenues from third-party app developers. The implication is that Apple only turned down that money because doing so was worth it in the long run to keep customers tied to their iPhones. Who turns down perfectly good money for giving customers what they want? A monopolist does. The Justice Department alleges not only did this make Apple's own iPhones worse, but it actually made phones worse across the whole market because it stifled the development of these cross-platform streaming apps. The government goes on to allege that Apple has selectively denied developers access to connection points to the operating system in order to prevent the development of cross-platform messaging apps, uh, interoperability with non-Apple smartwatches, and interoperability with non-Apple digital wallets. All of this, the government alleges, was to get customers locked into Apple's ecosystem. For instance, the complaint alleges that Apple undermines cross-platform messaging to reinforce obstacles to iPhone families giving their kids Android phones. The complaint says that Apple chose not to develop iMessage for Android and they sacrificed their short-term profits in order to preserve their monopoly power. Now Apple gets to put on a defense, but the government thinks it knows what Apple's gonna say. In its complaint, it gets out in front of Apple's anticipated counter arguments. And in one of the juiciest bits in the complaint, the complaint says, quote, Apple wraps itself in a cloak of privacy, security, and consumer preferences to justify its anti-competitive conduct. Indeed, it spends billions on marketing and branding to promote the self-serving premise that only Apple can safeguard consumers' privacy and security interests. The complaint goes on. Apple selectively compromises privacy and security interests when doing so is in Apple's own financial interest. In the end, Apple deploys privacy and security justifications as an elastic shield that can stretch or contract to serve Apple's financial and business interests. It will be interesting to see where this all goes next.